Allora, buon pomeriggio a tutti. Okay, good afternoon to everyone, finally. Um, actually, in the classroom, physically in the classroom, after years of lockdown and pandemics, finally, we find ourselves in the possibility of being here physically present. Now, good. So, good afternoon to everyone, finally, in presence uh, here, here in the uh, classroom after years of lockdown and pandemic, finally. We are able to be here physically. Now, good afternoon to everyone. Finally, we are here present physically after years of, excuse me, for the tech, there are always technical problems that are here. So we are here in the master, uh, the, the, the Aula Magna of uh, Pontifical Athenaeum Regina Apostolum and Mera in Rome. And we're beginning here like in all of the years. This is the sixth year, or the sixth edition of the course of specialization in neurobioethics. And it, the subject of this year uh, is neurobioethics and metaverse, neuroethics and metaverse. So Carrara, Professor Carrara will, will uh, bring us into this particular subject with critical um, analysis of uh, the scenarios of the metaverse. The idea of the metaverse, in effect, gives us a sense of um, loss, that we're getting loss. Um, uh, whether we look at this uh, subject uh, in a good or bad light, theology to uh, rational thought, because we're trained in our vision of the world, in which we are always brought to uh, overlap the map with the territory. Promise that, like that, uh, in, in an uh, un unconscious way, we always seek to realization what uh, Hegel called the absolute s spirit, which consists in self consciousness of what happens and the events and the awareness that falls in a man, man who historically. Okay, now the idea of creation of the of a virtual world goes beyond uh, theory, uh, theories that return. It laid down the basis of his uh, suspicious attitude towards technology and mass media, which today we call social networks. They didn't exist yet then. And he indicated it as a possible tool of coercion of power, a process, that line of boundary, which some authors indicated as that uh, passage from modernity to post-modernity, where, according to the example, because of the uh, spreading of these means of com communication, it's m m rendered the, the decisive for the dissolution of the se uh, uh, centrality of thought and a value base, which is typical of modernity and has favored post uh, access to post-modernity. So we need we should ask ourselves at this moment, what is there beyond postmodernity? And where is this field of technology that takes the name of the metaverse? Where can we place that? You know, do we imagine that it's a, 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 a dystopic world where the old classical uh, categories of thought that we used to uh, use, where the link and nunc of the ratio, uh, oh, Horace, of Horace, is demolished for the moment? only now exists and qui becomes uh, virtual and undefined if the metaverse becomes the development of unification of socialization and its transformation radical transformation what will be its effects in uh, today's world here this is the challenge that presents uh, itself to us in this in this uh, road it uh, takes a lot of effort requires effort and we'll try to face it from this train of progress. It's something that advances, and it seems that we cannot do anything about it except to seek in our possibilities and our classrooms to direct those uh, ethical walls that seek to push and make it so that, that this great machine, which is going forward, that it always remains in the, uh, uh, in the human 
that is in love for men and the centrality of men, that it remains within these boundaries. Now, I'll leave the floor to Professor Carrara at this point, who will accompany us in this uh, on this road. And it's certainly going to be an interesting road that we walk with him. And um, you will keep us uh, really nailed, uh, uh, hanging on his every word, because he will open a world to us that will that is unknown to many of us. Very good. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a joy what a joy and happiness to see you face to face uh, here physically uh, without a uh, mask in uh, the classroom and also the, all of those. I like to greet uh, all of those who are connecting from various uh, parts of the world, not only from Italy, but who are following us in Italy and then and from our places, our local uh, research centers of neuroethics uh, and from various countries in the world who are following our activities. I greet everyone and let's begin. And we are actually beginning uh, a new um, way this this year. It's going to be an, a substantial introduction, let's say, in the sense that we, I will try to see in the context, the framework uh, within which this sixth uh, course of uh, specialization in neuro, uh, neuroethics. And for those who want to follow, or who want to uh, register, there's time until the end of the uh, month, and there's time to uh, to register for the specialization course. You can follow our our page, which I'm going to share with you now, upra.org in the program. It's to come and directly to the page, dot .org. From there, you can directly proceed also, proceed. Uh, to how to uh, register and clicking by clicking here it's very easy and simple and there obviously there is a uh, parts of uh, points of reference that can be downloaded in emails and t telephone numbers so you can ask for your assistance what i'll try to do now here today is to give uh, a framework and an introduction and then uh, to go more deeply into the concepts in play and the concepts in play in this course of uh, a specialization we have around an hour and a half, and I hope that I can manage it. And for those who want to, now we'll insert, insert ourselves into the chat room, and you can download uh, that also. Now let, I'll insert that into the chat room. The presentation that I will follow is uh, that in which will make up the subject material, the, the course material, I'll show you, and you can upload it. I will insert it now, the link now in the chat room. I prepared it, a summary uh, for you uh, regarding the subject that we're going to take a look at today, and you can download it here. Download the presentation in PowerPoint, and I will give to you what I will follow in this afternoon, the notes that I'm going to follow. So if you insert yourself into the chat room, and I will, we will sell that, and we will send this presentation to you. <laughs> in our yeah, um, customary newsletter. Uh, in the meanwhile, for those who can follow us uh, live and cannot see the presentation so well, we'll put that into the chat room. We'll put that into the chat. Let's begin. Let's begin this new um, journey together here. OK. OK, good. Now, first of all, the title, Neurobioethics and Metaverse, course of uh, the specialization sixth edition, Neurobioethics and Metaverse. Now, in this presentation, we'll try also to show the importance, to highlight the importance of the subject of the metaverse as more as more in as much as it concerns our uh, research as a neurobioethical group. We know that neurobioethics, at least from the uh, registration, uh, from the description and the uh, the uh, the more complete definition that the research group adopts, it's defined as a systematic informed uh, investigation of the neurosciences, but not only on neurosciences, but also on all of those interpretations of the neurosciences themselves. Uh, so it can be placed, and here I recall a, a fact, and a very recent news, it is uh, located in this definition, which is not mine definition, it's the definition that those philosophers, John Clausen, Eddie gave in the monumental introduction, that monumental work 
in three volumes in the Manual of Neuroethics of Springer from uh, 2015. Three volumes, 850 pages, uh, 23 sections, and then 23 uh, chapters. It's certainly not a pocket uh, manual. It's not the last one. It's one of them, but it's one of the most prestigious uh, uh, manuals. And these two uh, philosophers uh, pl uh, define I mean, neuro by as a philosophical reflection because the, the systematic and informed uh, vision of a discipline, which implies their uh, reflection on the interpretation of the discipline itself, which we can take this character, this nucleus, which is uh, clearly philosophical regarding the neuroethical reflection. And uh, it's not uh, by chance then, the, the Magnifico Rector of the um, uh, Pontifical uh, Athenaeum Regina Apostolorum, we've inserted our research gr group at, after many years of research. We've, uh, in the, in, within the research group, we've uh, located in the, we've placed it within, under the uh, uh, Faculty of Philosophy in the Athenaeum. Now, what's our framework here? And here we, we present for the first time in a public way, this course, the sixth course, the sixth edition, in the course of specialization in neurobiophysics, the sixth edition. That doesn't mean that we have treated uh, the the theme of the metaverse five times. We, it means that we've had six journeys. Uh, those who remember, and, and neurobiophysics begins and is substantial, uh, fundamentally a research group, interdisciplinary, and it begin. It, we begin on the twenty eighth of Mar of March in. Uh, 2009 as a research group, and the research has been consolidating from 2017. We wanted not only that this research would, that it would be uh, set up and developed, but that that it could also open itself to the public, that it could open uh, itself through uh, courses of specialization. This one ends from 2017 and 18. We started a, a course, a, a course which we think is rather coherent. We wanted to take the those are basic uh, building blocks which from transhumanism, which is the current, the radical current of the post-humanism, uh, the uh, contemporary post-humanism, to try to analyze it from the critical point of view. What characterizes our group is, is the going deeply and the investigation, and not only to pause on the very positive and beautiful aspects of this, these two, as Pope Francis says, these two waves of great changes, two centuries of great uh, transformative say, uh, changes uh, and an epoch of uh, change, which is directed by the development, technological development, and not only that, and by basic research in the neuro, uh, uh, neurosciences and the disciplines that we're concerned in, the we've, which we have already considered. And therefore, we've want, what we wanted to do is to begin with an, a year dedicated 2017 and 18, and uh, the strange idea of uh, an Estonian uh, 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 head uh, transplant. Many of you, of us who have followed uh, us for years, and in fact, and here I put the uh, proof after a lot of time, because the volume, 446 pages long. And here we have the first volume that was published last year, in 2000. Uh, uh, 11 in the university press, we have a, a whole series of neurobiotics. Uh, uh, okay, interdisciplinary in reading of anast uh, somatic uh, uh, anastomosis in the human cephalus. Now, the first uh, of the series and the second that just came here, we have the editor of the volume Neurobiotics uh, Sexual Differences, the second volume of the series, and um. And it, uh, this month, I hope at the, mo at the latest in October, October, will come out the third volume dedicated to Annalise Anna Amaponsi's colleague from '73. Uh, uh, she con she coined the term neuroethics, a volume on that author. She's a, she was a great neuropsychiatrist who, for 60 years and six uh, did uh, carried out six decades of research. We could say she gave she opened great uh, lines of research, which are now the classical lines of research in the neuroethical, contemporary neuroethical uh, reflection. From 2018 and, to, and 19, we treated the, the issue of robotic ethics. So these are building blocks that are of this hybridization between man and machine, it, which is more and more evasive and pervasive. 2019, uh, we have the uh, logger ethics in this first edition. And then we had a second year with the second edition, 2008, 20, and 2021 on the theme of 
the you know, uh, challenges of, in, of artificial intelligence and algorithms, these no, neologians, which were coined by my brother, who is a, in the priesthood and religious life, who's a Francisco, uh, Father Paolo Benante in 2018, at least for the first time. I remember the three uh, uh, algor ethics, uh, the necessity of our ethical reflection regarding algorithmic uh, development. Last year, in 2021-22, we treated the theme of neurotechnologies. Okay, therefore, hybridization, uh, which is really pushed, not just technological, but biology, the pervasiveness of uh, biology and in the human being, uh, particularly in the uh, human brain and nervous system. So we uh, de dedicated a whole year to neurotechnologies. And now we will dedicate, we want, we are at this point, we, we want to dedicate the next year and this year, which is about to begin, and we're going to begin today regarding the theme of the metaverse. To speak of the metaverse can be a fashionable thing to say, a fashion. It becomes a passing fashion or a fashion or for having rendered this concept at the media level, of level of mass media, especially through the big uh, uh, followers of um, Silicon Valley and the technological, tech, the digital technological development. Everyone has some names in mind. And this metaverse was launched this year, especially. But as we will see, it has a long history behind it. And in order to understand the reality of meta metaverse, we have to clarify a later on a, a context of uh, we have to clarify certain important concepts, especially that of virtual reality. Therefore, what do we mean with uh, by uh, virtual reality? Obviously. To speak of uh, augmented reality implies to speak of those subcategorizations of mixed realities, as we will see. These are these. Uh, now, what are these uh, mixed uh, realities, of which augmented reality is a part? And then, uh, brick by brick, we uh, put together this uh, puzzle, which will, which we mean by the definition of uh, metaverse. Now, so we will try to take a look at definitions of these concepts, first of all, and the history. Because this is also very important to have to have a, a little bit of a, a familiarity with the history, and in order to be able to enter the to understand the intersection, uh, especially with some aspects of the uh, neurethical uh, contemporary uh, contemporary reflection, contemporary neurethical reflection. Therefore, our research group, uh, uh, neurobiotics, which is interdisciplinary in our brochure, is pre presented uh, in the specialization course this year, and by taking its. Uh, um, uh, inspiration from neuroscientific research and application to the human being of, uh, of emerging technology. Uh, we wanted to dedicate this year to uh, critical uh, going deeper into the uh, metaverse. And, then, and here we can say that we can make explicit something, one thing more regarding the application and medical uh, developments. That is one important aspect that we want to give to this uh, course of specialization will be the theme and the applications. And those scenarios in the medical and clinical level of the virtual reality and of augmented reality, and in particular regarding the neurological, neurosurgical, and psychiatric framework up until the philosophical, theological, neuroethical reflection on this on the very same technological instruments. Therefore, the solicitation from robotics and the development of AI, multiple application of uh, human enhancement, uh, uh, demand from men and women today who are called to know and to decide with awareness the direction to give to pro technological progress. This is one of the points that we would like to, that we could say, uh, one, one of the abilities or one of the formative uh, uh, objectives of this uh, specialization course is to mm, know and development and to form a critical sense, therefore an awareness that it not be an awareness that's just um, given and assumed in a in an, an active way, but that it be an awareness that is active, and which is the result of a uh, of a uh, of a course of an itinerary of a process. This is what we want to get. Uh, and uh, I want to make a confession here in the sense that in every course, uh, we researchers and of neurobioethics, we need to say that we are also we are solicited uh, to do to make to take this journey in this course. But not all are experts in their beyond their own sector. Not everyone is a clinical worker or a philosopher, or biologist, or engineer. This is why we have the importance and necessity of a group of research that it be interdisciplinary. This sixth course of uh, specialization 
would like to collect the fruits of reflection that we have. There's us uh, uh, researchers from this day on. In this way, I've already begun from uh, uh, reflecting on these uh, issues for a time. We'd like to uh, walk to, together with you and to offer to you as students and as uh, uh, this a fruit of reflection to you also as re re researchers in this program, which will be uh, un uh, unfolded and, and streaming and online and also in written form, we always have the possibility to have the event uh, in our place uh, in the classroom, uh, thanks be to God, and in streaming, through streaming, and also asynchronous and screen and written way. And the first of all, October, that will be open. We will uh, close it then for uh, researchers and neurobiotics and those who will be registered later on. And then from November on, we will only have these two categories of those uh, those who are researchers and uh, uh, those who are registered who will be able to follow our activities. Others can receive the the um, updates and the uh, um, uh, uh, summaries. Now, now in the brochure, uh, we can see, in order to remember, Yeah, there will be the World Day of the Brain, the anniversary of 50 years from the introduction in the article of Ghost of uh, 1973. And Aliza Manaponcius, this neuropsychiatrist, coined, where she coined the neologism, uh, neuroethics. It's a very specialistic uh, uh, article which was which passed unobserved for many years. And in the course of St. Francis, uh, Francisco in 2000, where neuroethics became a practically present at the public, public and immediate mass media level for the first time in a international uh, um, in San Francisco and California were promoted by the Dana Foundation, the University of Stanford University and other institutions. Uh, in that con convention, Anna Lisa was not present and for many years. And later on, the figure of this neuropsychiatrist was not taken into consideration precisely because the, her article was very specialistic and published in a uh, in a, a periodical of motor skills, motor skills uh, uh, with a very particular context. After an experience of 13 years, the neurobiotical uh, group offered from September to June, uh, we'll have a, a monthly uh, uh, um, uh, encounter, and then we have many events later on. For those who remember, the group is very active. So we we'll also offer events and other initiatives during the year, which will be complimentary and will enrich this course. It will be a packet of, of 10 uh, round uh, table uh, sessions and including the March convention because uh, the Dana Foundation at least uh, found uh, all sets aside a brain awareness week, or the world week of the brain. Regarding technological aspects and neurological and neurosurgical and psychiatric and psychological and ethical and bioethical and juridical and biological relative to the co concept of the metaverse, um, they will be reflection on all of those aspects. The, the uh, primary aim is to become uh, aware of the repercussions and ethological consequences and ethical and legal and uh, healthcare and social uh, uh, consequences of the application of uh, augmented um, uh, uh, reality on the human being. Now, the emphasis we'd like to select is a consideration of the principles that are sanctioned by the Declaration Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights of UNESCO from 2005. This sensibility will t specifically touch the uh, subjects relative to the limits and dignity and identity and value of the human body, uh, in addition to its uh, disposability and indisposability. The promoters of the Faculty of Bioethics and the UNESCO uh, Cathedra, uh, Chair of Bioethics and Human Rights, and the Institute of Science and Faith, and uh, there, we see the neurobioethical group uh, arises and uh, 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 arose uh, as a research group of uh, neurobioethics. So therefore, I thank these organizations and Father uh, Pasquale, Director of the Institute of Science and Faith. Okay, let's begin with an introduction. And here I will speak uh, in key uh, words regarding the history of the reflection and criticism at the level of mean, uh, mass media. A figure, an important figure, maybe who's not so well not known, who also wrote various books, and we're talking about Marshall McLuhan. We could say that we are the uh, um, heirs of a third part of Laudato Si, the technocratic paradigm 
Pope Francis in number 102 on to speak, uh, to speak of these great two great uh, centuries. We are the heirs of two centuries of great changes. We, and he, and any any and numbers four great industrial revolutions this exponential group uh, growth also and this acceleration and now we see the acceleration of progress from the uh, agricultural rev revolution to the industrial revolution and the introduction of electricity and computational power and today we're speaking of the scenarios concerning uh, biotechnologies and uh, artificial intelligence of robotics. And today we need to include the subject of virtual reality, augme augmented reality and of the metaverse. And we are in this fourth great industrial revolution. And some people also say the fifth uh, industrial revolution. We find ourselves in this mo historical moment, which is very important, this important historical moment. And we went to in introduce in, in, the, the issue of new mass media and which uh, which bind an intangible contents which express an, a message. There's a fear, an, an important figure, which is that of Marshall McLuhan, and who is a great point of departure from which we can begin this discussion. And we will see that when speaking of the metaverse, that that implies speaking of virtual or augmented and mixed realities, which are the technical aspects and operational aspects in order to be able to build what still does not yet exist. I say this regarding the metaverse, and then we'll see in the end. Today, it does not exist. It, 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 could, it could exist, as we will see, what we mean by metaverse, because we all have the elements, realities, virtual and mixed and augmented realities, etc. We have these elements, but we're still missing some important uh, uh, developments so that there can really exist a metaverse not only uh, it doesn't only imply imply technical aspects it also Im implies uh, refl very important uh, reflections as far as uh, uh, subjects which relate to anthropology for example philosophical anthropological aspects and um carry and uh, and also re which concern corporate uh, not by chance the human sense the human sense uh, which is predilected is uh, okay now this the whole issue of immersion and embodiment and incorporation some translate it as incarnation but it's better to say incorporation a theme and the concept we'll see which is which in the end, which is one of the important issues is the reflection on the concept of presence and telepresence and then also the subject of identity there will be some points of reflection that i uh, latch on to in this introduction in this first seminar they will be useful to show to highlight or to uh, throw uh, down some of the points that we will go more deeply into from now and in uh, June of the next year. The challenges, the challenges in the field, um, in the mental sphere, psychiatry, uh, psychiatric and psychological aspects of and of well-being, physical well-being, the ethical challenges, not not to mention juridical uh, uh, challenges, which are already showing up when we speak of the metaverse. And then some principles, and these principles will be, there, there exist, they will already exist. There exists already a manifesto of seven big principles in order to build the metaverse. Okay, the first concept is the capacity of interoperativity and that great challenge that today makes it so that there, that, that it doesn't, that metaverse does not exist. It exists as a concept, it exists as a real uh, idealization and as a possibility it exists, but However, as we'll see, it does not yet exist as a reality. Therefore, these two great centuries, and we need to take a look at them and see them as, as a chain reaction, uh, not by chance. Our, for our um, uh, courses, they are uh, linked together. They are uh, linked together, and there will be an important link regarding, regarding a part of the development into their, uh, and uh, uh, technological development which permits the uh, feasibility of those platforms that we talk, we call Internet 3.0 or, or Internet 3.0, so 2.0, that is cell phones and computers. And, so. and then the realities that are called ex extended realities, which are those accessories. In the classroom, we have our visor, which are those accesses to the access. Uh, 
points uh, to virtual reality, we certainly, which we've uh, tested just a few minutes ago before the beginning of the course through this simple, this is a visor that's very simple, then maybe in the following months, we can, we will do, carry out some simulations. Those who are, will be, who are present in the classroom will also be able to um, have this advantage of testing out one of the o Oculus, which is a very much, very, very, very much more development, uh, much more developed than this simple example that we have here. And those rea those extended realities, which uh, permit us to conceive and, and speak about the metaverse in a better way. Therefore, okay, let's enter and let's start talking about uh, virtual reality. Who is this Marsh McLuhan, who bore, was born in 1911 and died in 1980, the year in which I was born, 1980. He's a professor, Canadian sociologist, philosopher, a literary critic and professor, university pre university pre and his fame was connected to his interpretation and no innovative interpretation of the effects that are produced by communication. Especially, he wrote many interesting works, many interesting books on society overall, and also on regarding behavior of uh, individuals and is in a significant reflection that I think will stimulate our reflections in the following months. Certainly also, yeah, there's some, okay, obviously, um, if we speak of the great philosophers that went deeply in from the philosophical point of view, who went into the problem of technology and other uh, philosophical uh, problems uh, like the philosophic. Okay, today uh, we have this uh, in any field and in many sectors. This is at the center of reflection. Also, in the uh, uh, church level, we there's a dicastery dedicated to communications and uh, mass media. The reflection of Marshall McLuhan. Uh, gave rise, uh, sorry, raised the hypothesis uh, according to which uh, technological means determine and characterize a structural uh, way of uh, communication and pr pr produce uh, pervasive effects on the collective imag uh, imagination. Independent of the uh, um, of the uh, uh, contents of communication that are uh, channeled, he has this thesis or this hypothesis in a uh, motto or way of saying. And he, according to this thesis, the the, sale, the medium is the message. The medium is the message, is his motto. A long series of works, we're just going to cite this one, mention this one, uh, quote this one, from uh, uh, the mechanical, the mechanical spouse, 1951, the, the uh, Gutenberg galaxy, 1976, uh, the making of the typographic man, Rutledge and Kim Paul, very good publisher, okay, in which, in that book, in the instrument of communication is extracted, 67 the medium is the message that's when you start to see that motto of his okay then there um, um war and peace in the global village in 68 and then 1889 the global village then medium and light reflections on religion the work of 2002 in a paperback edition and let's take into consideration some of these works some of these books uh, let's just sum up some of them which will be useful for us as points of reflection the uh, the Gutenberg Galaxy, this book, McLuhan uh, underlies for the first time the importance of mass media and the hist in human history. In particular, he discusses the influence of uh, the press and uh, mobile characters on the history of uh, Western culture from 1955 and how it changed. And in fact, that book illustrates how the, uh, the, uh, uh, how the advent of the in the book of McLuhan, illustrates how the advent of the press and uh, and movable type is, it, uh, carries out the uh, definitively the passage from oral culture to alphabetical culture. Uh, if in the oral culture, the word is a living force, resonant, active, and natural, in the alphabetic culture, the word becomes a mental uh, uh, meaning, which is uh, connected to the past. All the experience is reduced to a single sense, that is a sight. Not by chance, with the, the theme of sight is the fundamental uh, aspect of the uh, development of virtual reality and also of the augmented reality and the metaverse. The transition from prevalence of a one sense of the hearing of oral culture to prevalence of, a, of, a, of, a, of sight and written culture with printing uh, goes back and 
but he, he sees percussions on the our way of perceiving the world and to give it a, set, a meaning to it. This is a very interesting, this reflection on the perception and sense and meaning. Oral con, uh, okay. Uh, the transition of the from the present prevalence of an of of one meaning, the uh, hearing of oral culture, to the prevalence of another. Uh, okay, now oral communication is inserted in a relationship, re in a it implies implies our sense of community. He says, on the contrary, the commun written con uh, communication, which is channeled by sight, brings us into a modality of a more distant reality, which is less emotional. To communicate through the sense of sight. We tend to exercise our singularity more and our, he says, rationality. The press is the technology. Uh, the press is a technology of nationalism, individualism, and quantification of, and mechanization of, uh, and the homogeneity in the end, it's technology that has rendered possible the modern era. The means is the message. Okay. The spread. The, in addition, the, uh, uh, the uh, printing and uh, movable type uh, was, com com was uh, uh, combined with other uh, means of communication. Okay, this, this, okay, the, no. he shows how the spreading of the book exercised a uh, significant influence also in the modality and approach to the, uh, to the cinema screen. This is interesting, and will how we see a uh, long history throughout history, how how important it will be to understand the development of these technologies, from photo, photo, photography to cinematography to the development of these realities. Now, once and people are trained and uh, habituated to a reading from left to right and from above to bottom, McLuhan says in the uh, Western canon, the eye will tend to read and to receive information that passes through the uh, uh, screen, through a cinema and, or TV, according to a, a textual uh, visualization. But evidently, on the basis of the, his reflection, there's a particular school, which is that of Toronto, together with, which together with his other scholar, Walter Hong. McLuhan is one of the greatest representatives of this. Obviously, we find that this school today has a uh, has a accentuated uh, technological determination. That is the idea that the mental structure of people and the culture are influenced by type of technology of which such a society disposes of or uses. In another work, instruments of uh, that uh, is to be communicate, which is the greatest, the most well-known book of McLuhan, because here we contain the, the uh, motto that the means is the message. This constitutes an a innovative uh, research project in the ecology of means of communications, MS media. He affirms that it's important to read, to study the media, not based on the uh, co uh, contents that they channel, but based on structural uh, 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 criteria with which they organize the communication. He sums up everything else that the means is the mess is the is the means. The means is the message. Like, you know, it's a uh, it's misleading to. Okay. Okay. His reflection, its reflection, definitely goes beyond and embraces and generalizes any type of media. According to McLuhan, medium is anything, mass media is any, a media is anything that gives rise to a change. According to that aspect, even the clock can be defined as a medium. And as much as it has transformed the uh, mode uh, that we, we, which we perceive and manage time, the book, uh, which is entitled in English, Understanding Media, he understands media here in the translation into Italian, it's says the uh, tool to communicate. This takes, this uh, brings us into a misleading idea in Italian. Now, in this text, in the era of me of machines, we have operated an extension of our body in a spatial sense. Today, after more than a century, now even more than now a century and a half, in the, with the technological use of electricity, and AI and robotics, et cetera, we would say today, we have extended our uh, nervous uh, central system in, in a global embrace, which at least uh, is our, uh, pla uh, our uh, planet is concerned, it abolishes uh, as, uh, time in as much as it abolishes space. The first media uh, uh, analyzed by him is uh, is uh, printing. And he observes, in fact, that uh, 
uh, the printing had a great uh, role uh, uh, in Western. Uh, uh, it brought us to um, in the West to the Protestant Reform and uh, Enlightenment, etc. And then the theme of industrialization and mass production and uh, mass literacy and mass education. And, uh, and we can assert that any technology can uh, constitutes a medium in the sense that it, it is an extension. It is a strengthening of the human faculty. This is very interesting. Any technology is an extension uh, strengthening of the human faculty. I recall the whole um, uh, uh, when we went over the paradigm that the paradigm is not substitution of the integrative uh, uh, paradigm. We are say technology. We are a technological man in the sense homo technologicus in the sense in, in, uh, any okay so which is necessary to evaluate the impact of mass media in terms of sociological and psychological implications okay McLuhan affirms that the contents of a transmission has in reality a minimal effect in the presence of programs for children or uh, violent uh, 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 programs. It's a force. This is a forcing of things, he says, and it tends to uh, accent the instrument, uh, the structure of the instrument, which is often for, for forgotten in favor of the contents. Uh, he highlights the, the underlines the issue of the uh, instrument to simplify. Uh, five. Uh, it has a different. Uh, he says that the consequence of the, the uh, television and the structure of the cinema have a uh, particular impact on society and individuals which must be received and analyzed. McLuhan observes that every means has characterized which uh, involve uh, the spectators in a different way. The passage of a book can be reread re and reread, but before the uh, advent of video cassettes, uh, a film had to be retransmitted to, uh, entirely in order to be able to study a single part. Thanks to God, this is not like that. And now, in this text, uh, in this uh, framework, and McLuhan introduces the classification of means of media, which he called Kali uh, Efedi. Among the most illuminating thesis, which for which every new technology, including the uh, 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 the uh, the press and the uh, and printing and the wheel, exercises on us a a, a flattery which is very powerful, through uh, which it hypnotizes us into a state of narcissistic torpor. In fact, a total immersion of the media logic can bring us uh, in an unaware way, uh, man to a condition of technological idiot, or that is a, a, a kind of narcosis and um, and uh, weakening that's able to make us, okay, if we do not have in, uh, uh, appropriate intellectual antibodies, in this way we are trying to favor this analogy with the immune system, this uh, uh, neurobethical, uh, uh, reflection by uh, neurobiotics it will help us to develop, like, like a vaccine, to develop uh, some antibodies, intellectual antibodies, which will be able, which will bring us, which so that we will not accept as absolute axioms and unneutral uh, 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 regarding technology that we want to discuss. Okay. If, on the other hand, we manage to avoid being uh, uh, devoured by them, we can look that technology from the outside with the detachment and also from inside, but also entering into it and touching it and emerging ourselves and, invol and involving ourselves. And at that point, we cannot, we can not only see the underlying principles and the force that they exert, but also social be changes become an open book for us and we can uh, into it them beforehand and in part to control them. Now, this is also interesting vision of the artist. For reasons of time, we cannot uh, uh, digress too much on that. Uh, he, um, McLuhan and, and Truss, okay, in this, uh, uh, in this essay, he proposes an interesting vision of the artist related to technology and media. McLuhan uh, entrusts to the artist an essential uh, role, and he defines him as the man who in any field, scientific or humanistic field, uh, grasps the implications of his own actions and science of his time. 
the expression the medium is the message okay no, we, it is man it is the man of integral awareness the artist can anticipate the effects of a new technology and uh, pre and foresee the annihilation of conscious activity and the and the torp torpitude of the man of the uh, brain this message the message the means of the mission the me the means of the message uh, it tells us therefore that every media it should be studied based on a structural criteria based on which it organizes communication. It is proper, uh, it, it has its own uh, structure, a proper structure, communicative structure to each medium, which renders it non neutral. Uh, so, uh, for which it uh, gives rise to, uh, in the um, user spectator, determined behaviors and ways of thinking and brings him to the formation of a certain form, uh, forma mentis, a certain way of thinking. No. Now, TV, he talks about TV at one point. Now, for him, and for him, it's a means of confirmation, not a medium that gives a rise to it. It affects, uh, okay, no. And his work from 1968, the global village, this village, this global village is a metaphor, an oxymoronic uh, metaphor, which he adopts in order to indicate how, with the development of mass media through the advent of satellites at the time. We open a whole issue here, St. Paul the Sixth regarding when man uh, landed on the moon. He made a metaphysical reflection in the beauty of science, which permitted communications in real time, uh, long distance. The world became small. This is why he uses the term global village and assumed consequences and, uh, and uh, behaviors that are typical of village. In the work Understanding Media of 16.4, he wrote that today, after more than a century of, techno of electrical technology, what we said before, uh, we've extended of our central nervous system and, and it has now a global embrace. And we've abolished uh, limits of time and uh, space regarding our planet. The concept that is at the basis of this information is the belief of the a scholar in the fact that technology, electronic technology, had become an extension of our senses, in particular uh, the senses of sight and hearing. Therefore, this new, these new form of com forms of communication at the time became the radio and television had transformed the global into a st physical a space that's much more contracted than it used to be, had been, in which movement of information on the one, from one place to the another in the world had become practically instantaneous. And the formation of a globality and of a community, a global community, which is wide, but also very integrated in its various parts, encourages the development of new forms of involvement, national and international level, and also of responsibilities. And therefore, the term village, global village, is understood by McLuhan in two senses. On the, from the more literal point of view, he refers to, the, uh, 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 to a small space in which people can rapidly communicate with each other in such a way the information becomes much more uh, widespread, immediate. In fact, through our senses, our external uh, senses, each one of us, by experience in real time, can experience uh, the events which happen uh, physically on the other face of the other side of the world. Well, then there's another uh, wider perspective. Uh, where he understands glo global communication, in which everyone is connected with everyone else through in a harmonious and homogeneous space. <laughs> homogeneous space. Two phrases, two texts of McLuhan, which are interesting for the, our reflection, which are emblematic. One which is taken from the two taken from instrument of, to communicate that book. which We have given our nervous senses. Uh, we have handed them to the manipulation of those who seek to uh, get profits and uh, uh, rent our eyes, our hands. In reality, we don't have any rights anymore. This is very interesting, this reflection. It's very strong also. And to give our eyes, our nerves, and uh, ears to commercial uh, uh, interests and uh, and it gives a common languages to a private, and you can give monopoly to a side the, uh, the, in the uh, terrestrial atmosphere. In another passage, he says, sometimes it's a little bit shocking to remember that in the operative fact is, in fact, is the message, the, the message is the message, the means is the message. This is simply uh, to know that the personal and social consequences of any 
means, that is the almost the almost extension of ourselves. It ends up being the new scale, which is introduced to our business uh, by any extension of ourselves and of any new technology. Now, from thought to words, by passing, by scripture to other uh, site, uh, cinema, uh, radio, telephone, uh, to our computers and tablets and smartphones that we have today, access to the internet world, more technology progresses, the more complex uh, the way our way of structuring and communicating the message it becomes. This is a vision, a kind of evolution of communication from thought to the word up until the development, today's developments. We could add also that the more complex the system of communication becomes, the more uh, the distance and spatial and temporal spaces uh, 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 shorten regarding contents. In any case, uh, according to McLuhan, every means remains empty unless a contents is formulated. And especially every new means, which is invented by man, it possesses its, uh, uh, the okay, the contents of every means is always another means, he says to us. And it um, shows a kind of stratification, which, uh, which, uh, which, uh, uh, which, uh, which, um, uh, describes human progress in the communication realm. Now, how can we describe and place a means like that of a reality, a virtual reality, RV? We can begin to give it a definition or at least some definitions or description or just uh, descriptions. And we can say the following, that by analyze through the theories of McLuhan, it appears, rea virtual reality appears as an instrument, a hybrid instrument, ha it's half uh, midway between uh, information technological uh, uh, and uh, and and our heads and our eyes and everything that are moved in a simulated environment, uh, which is the channel of the message, vehicle of the channel. So it's a hybrid instrument, a new medium, which uh, channels an intangible uh, contents and expresses a message. And it is the uh, okay. It still remains a fruit of antecedent media means. And it's um, interlinked, historically interlinked with the passage between photo um, with pho photography, cinema, television, cell phones, PCs, and the web. <coughs> it has uh, significant effects which have been applied in films like Matrix. Cinema, television, cell phone, the PC and web. Any invention or technology is an extension of a or, or a self amputation of our physical bodies. Such an extension and such an extension requires also new relationships and new balances among the other organs and extensions of the body. This uh, shortening of space between oneself and that which can represent re virtual reality uh, uh, is today is one of the most uh, 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 successful uh, tools in this attempt to uh, deceive the perception that we have of ourselves and of space uh, and the surrounding space. Or Francisco D'Agostino reminded us in various in various of his essays, in particular regarding the theme of technology as techne, as it used to mean uh, uh, deception. Here we would need to enter into okay, here the count. My, I, uh, uh, now I suggest this book to you, Biothics uh, to the Future, to technicize man or human, humanize technology. Technologize man. Uh, Father Joseph Tamba wrote this and uh, Massimo Luzito wrote this together. And here there's a preface in the first chapter of Professor D'Agostino on the subject of anthropological reflection between technology, techne, and technology. And we see the, we see this introduction of technology, the problem of, with Martin Heidegger, um, technology towards which we have an attitude uh, which which is ambivalent. It fascinates us, charms us on the one hand, but it uh, it uh, brings us as uh, worry and anxiety. And and it's basically human, if we think of the whole issue of anthropologists who read the biology of, uh, of lackings, the biology, which is very lacking and unwilled by the human being, that uh, our Gallen and other authors who in the 20th century reflected on this, and they also reach, uh, they demonstrate how effectively 
the part of rationality and will of the human being is the space that makes it so that we are technological beings by nature. This technological dimension, which is a, essentially fundamentally intrinsic uh, to the human being. We're taken now, D'Agostino says that technology is born from a malicious a laziness of man through uh, it, we are able to uh, emanate a. Uh, uh, yeah. We are through through uh, technology. We're able to deceive nature, uh, imitating it uh, in order to facilitate uh, physical and psychic life. We could speak of uh, thanks to technology, our intelligence and will can realize things that our body could not. The myth, myth of Prometheus and Pythagoras, Platonic or Pythagoras, illustrate this uh, consciousness, this original human conscious. Now, at this point, we can pass on to the description of technological constitution of the uh, tool of virtual reality, which is placed within that what are defined as extended realities, so-called extended realities, which also make, uh, and include mixed reality, augmented reality, and the differences in peculiarities of each means, and how the perception of space and the interaction changes, uh, starting out with the basic of uh, uh, augmented reality, which are permitted in many aspects of daily life. Those years ago, don't, had, had not yet seen if they'd or at least played with Pokemon Go when, when it came out also with some excesses and some uh, problems uh, up until virtual reality. We see listed here, uh, and uh, some of the historical principal historical steps of this are listed, which brought up to the cloning of the visor, the building of the visor, and uh, uh, the principal influence uh, is born from photography, and from the cinematographer, and passing on to the construction of the first uh, prototype called the Spada di Dama, uh, the, the, the 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 blade of Damocles, and uh, up until the 1960s, and then a, a declined uh, lens, and then a a, 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 a film from 19, uh, uh, from uh, 2010s. And I'd like to dedicate uh, some of the principal changes of uh, application of the use of these uh, instruments within the program of our course of uh, specialization. Obviously we cannot touch all of the fields of application. It would be impossible. We'd have to dedicate another addition to them. Then we'll see if we can do that in virtual reality. Let's take a look at that. Definition of a new means, okay? Fact. Let's ask, okay. Hey, just a moment. Just a moment. In 2015, in a public event, the multimedia uh, um, citation to speak of virtual realities is like uh, speaking of architecture. He referred to, in paraphrased, another famous phrase regarding, ironically, this uh, um, uh, director uh, speaking about technology of the uh, 1980s and 90s when we saw the appearance of the first uh, immersive uh, experiments on three dimensions. He, yeah, he, uh, he, we had the primordial hand uh, gloves to favor interaction and first visor. He me, moved in a circumscribed uh, area space and he experienced the uh, virtual reality. We saw how, how the moving, which uh, were made up of users, which interacted with virtual reality. We did not have uh, experiences before. They gave an idea of, uh, of as dancing in an architecture, a virtual architecture. A situation which is not absolutely changed up until today, which paradoxically is still more accentuated thanks to the improvement of these technologies. Okay? To speak, virtual reality can be difficult and complex since we're talking about conceptualizing of a totalizing uh, immersive experience, which are 
with the use of a media and constant uh, update. We could we could make an analogy with uh, music. It in, involves a sensor and visual and cognitive face of person. It ends up being an extremely versatile instrument, which can have uh, more subjective uh, implications if it's used in the cultural and of entertainment and uh, an artistic and uh, recreation field or an objective uh, uh, application if it's used by companies for research and communication and et cetera, as we'll see. On a purely technical field, virtual reality is a set of simulations. And that way we could have simulations of a space, a three-dimensional space, which are recreated with the use of graphics, computerized graphics, through the use of various softwares, information softwares, which are reproduced through a one or more uh, uh, hardware which permit inter immersion uh, uh, interaction with the created reality. So we could add that as a kind of definition, uh, comprehensive definition. That system of simulation is very important. Of the it's a very important philosophical important thing. The concept of simulation is very philosophically important concept. And a uh, 3D space is recreated with the use of computerized graphics with the use of various information software. Here we have the whole issue of algorithms and uh, programs, information through one or more interaction immersion with the artificial purely technical, uh, purely technical level. Term and the concept. Some uh, historical uh, concept is introduced in a virtual reality is introduced at the end of the 1950s in the sensorama with the uh, sensorama with the introduction introduction of first prototype of a 3D visor uh, at the end of uh, the 1960s was created by information uh, technician of e named Evan Sutherland. This invention was. Uh, Tapin and his colleagues managed to overcome the barrier of the screen to mid dimensions in order to permit per complete immersion into a simulated world, which was constructed in such a way that, on the one hand, it, sang, it sounded real and it was perceived as real, and that the actions were uh, uh, carried out seemed real. This was the objective of this simulation. However, the term virtual reality was introduced by information technology, Jaron, technician Jaron Lanier, who gave a definition, an artistic definition of this means uh, uh, by underlining its intrinsic potentialities of, of the means. And he said that it would be a form, uh, a form of art of the 20th century, which uh, intersected the cinema, the jazz, and programming. And despite the development of media with the passage of the years, this maintains, in any case, some principal characteristics. The, re the seeking of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, true appearance and the key of immersion and the capacity to create a virtual uh, reality. Okay, from the historical point of view, we could start out with very much more distant times. This is a historical um, myth of the Platonic uh, cave to the Middle Ages. And then we can start from the experiments with a stereoscope invented by Charles Winston in 1838 and the Oculus, which were the most recent. Uh, okay, this stereoscope, which uh, laid down the basis for the design of what would become future modern uh, tele televisions, it, it uh, uh, it exploits uh, natural vision, binocular natural vision of human sight uh, and the physiological ability to perceive depth in a field, field depth experiments. This is the stereoscope, and uh, which is invented by Sir Charles Wheatstone in 1830. Now, now, photography is very important. Okay. Conosciuto come l'inventore del movimento in fotografia, i suoi studi e le sue immagini sono stati fondamentali per l'evoluzione della tecnica fotografica e hanno influenzato anche la pittura, la scultura, fino ad anticipare la nascita del cinema. Qui per i nostri esperti neuroeticisti ricordiamo un importante fatto storico. Nel 1860 subì Moibright 
una ferita alla testa in un incidente, in una diligenza nel Texas e abbiamo studi importanti e ipotetici ovviamente perché come nel caso di Phineas Cage 1800, ehm, nel Phineas Cage è quel 1848, quindi siamo prima, qualche anno, qualche anno de decada prima, vent'anni prima, Phineas Cage, quel famoso caso neuroetico in cui una barra di ferro eh, da un'esplosione gli penetrò dallo zigomo eh, del mandibolare inferiore sinistro e fu riuscita dalla teca cranica, quindi dan danneggiando, tranciando il nervo ottico e poi danneggiando la corteccia orbitofrontale, in questo caso misterioso, in cui la persona nemmeno perse conoscenza, sopravvisse e visse no, nove anni eh, di vita in più, gli comportò un cambio drastico della personalità, da una persona mite e una persona pacifica divenne una persona aggressiva, fini a Cage. Nel caso di Edward McBride abbiamo una letteratura neuroetica interessante in cui un caso di eh, in danno cerebrale che favorì o fu un cofattore che favorì un, una trasformazione di personalità che poi eh, diede origine o contribuì a dare origine a uno sviluppo, un'invenzione per quanto riguarda l'ambito la, del movimento in fotografia. Lancio questi spunti di riflessione. Ehm, e infatti cosa successe? Eh, nel 1872, insieme a un, a un uomo d'affari, che chiese a McBride di confermare una ipotesi, ovvero che durante il galoppo di un cavallo esiste un istante in cui tutte le zampe sono sollevate da terra. Secondo voi è vero o no? I come no? I progetti e gli studi di McBride in merito dovettero però interrompersi a causa di un drammatico evento. Ehm, lui ammazzò la moglie, perché la trovò con, con l'amante, e ehm, poi venne assolto, ritenuto un omicidio giustificato in quel periodo, era il 1874. Nel 1877 riprese l'esperimento del cavallo sul movimento del cavallo e nel 1878 fotografò con successo un cavallo in corsa utilizzando 24 fotocamere sistemate parallelamente lungo il tracciato. Ogni singola macchina veniva azionata da un filo colpito dagli zoccoli del cavallo. Quindi la sequenza di fotografie chiamate The Horse in Motion mostrò come gli zoccoli si sollevassero dal terreno contemporaneamente, ma non nella posizione di completa estensione, come era comunemente raffigurato. Perciò apparvero assurde. Era infatti convinzione comune che il cavallo, che il cavallo si staccasse completamente da terra nella posizione di massima estensione e questa situazione fu spesso raffigurata nei dipinti dei disegni dagli inizi del 1800. I risultati di Moebright sconvolsero questa visione e influenzarono pesantemente l'attività dei pittori, che si affidarono sempre più al mezzo fotografico per meglio riprodurre quello che l'occhio umano confonde. Molti pittori utilizzarono fotografie di figure umane per colpirle, per copiarle nei loro quadri. E quindi l'analisi di McBride, alcuni dicono questo, le fotografie di McBride rivelano chiaramente gli errori in cui sono insorti tutti gli scultori e i pittori quando hanno voluto rappresentare le diverse andature del cavallo. Vabbè, cosa ci interessa questo del cavallo? Ci interessa perché questa tecnica della cronofotografia per studiare il movimento degli animali e delle persone diede, e anche lui l'applicò poi negli studi di biomeccanica e meccanica sugli atleti, questo metodo che eh, inaugurò nel 1878 in poi e che poi eh, progettò nel 1880 questo Zopraxiscopio, uno strumento simile che permise la proiezione delle immagini permettendo anche la visione a, contemporanea a più, persone, più persone del movimento di animali, nasce, con, possiamo dire così, nasceva così il cinematografo. A Muy Bright anche si deve lo sviluppo di un particolare effetto, che è l'effetto che, eh, se avete visto il film Matrix, l'effetto che viene dato nella, nel film Matrix si chiama Bullet Time, un effetto speciale tecnica cinematografica che consente di mostrare al rallentatore un momento di una scena, restituendo l'impressione visiva di un distaccamento nel tempo e nello spazio della prospettiva della telecamera o dell'osservatore rispetto al soggetto mostrato. 
Questo effetto bullet time è in realtà lo sviluppo di una vecchia tecnica fotografica conosciuto, co conosciuta come fetta di tempo, nella quale un grande numero di fotocamere è disposto attorno ad un oggetto e viene fatto scattare simultaneamente. Quando la sequenza degli scatti è vista come un filmato, lo spettatore vede come le fette bidimensionali formano una scena tridimensionale. Guardare quindi una, una tale sequenza di fette nel tempo è analogo all'esperienza reale di camminare attorno ad una statua, quello che adesso si realizza con la realtà virtuale o aumentata, come appare da diverse angolazioni. Dobbiamo poi passare, saltare al 1957. Il regista statunitense Morton Hale lavorò sulla realizzazione di un dubice progetto, da una parte quello che si chiamò il sensorama e l'altro si chiamava Stereoscopic Television Apparatus for Individual Use. Riprendendo in parte il concetto eh, del... Uh, i, i concetti precedenti, il sensorama prevedeva una fruizione singola dove lo spettatore si trovava, vedete, completamente all'interno, immerso, a fare un'esperienza in una serie di cortometraggi grazie a un sistema di lenti stereoscopiche che ricreavano l'effetto tridimensionale delle riprese. Un impianto audio stereo in aggiunta eh, con un sedile mobile, come vedete lì, a destra, bocchette per la presa d'aria, diffusori di profumi, anche quindi c'era anche, diciamo, una immersione anche dal punto di vista anche olfattiva. Per quanto non prevedesse un'interazione diretta con il cortometraggio proiettato, risulta assai chiaro che l'intento principale di Hale fosse quello di aumentare l'illusione dell'immersione, quindi è un effetto di illusione, coinvolgendo il maggior numero di sensi possibili. Una nuova forma di cinema delle attrazioni in quanto risulta ancora difficile creare un linguaggio narrativo con questi nuovi strumenti. La successiva evoluzione fu quella del 1960, che questo apparato, l'idea di fondo, si sviluppa partendo dalla televisione e, e prevedeva l'uso di una serie di elementi uguali a quelli usati nella realtà virtuale contemporanea. Interessante, siamo nel 1960, vedete lì la, la figurazione, no? È come quel, quel visore che abbiamo qui praticamente. Avvicinandosi maggiormente al concetto, ehm, un, al concetto di Erno. Un visore che integra un paio di lenti stereoscopiche a cui dietro sono stati aggiunti due tubi di raggi catodici, chiudendo così completamente il visore, assieme a un paio di cuffie esterne. A livello sonoro e visivo lo strumento permetteva una completa immersione in una serie di riprese cinematografiche. Le unità ottiche, con una speciale disposizione delle lenti, che piegheranno i raggi periferici provenienti dal tubo televisivo in modo che entrino negli occhi dell'utente dai lati dello stesso, crea, creando la sensazione di visione periferica, riempiendo un arco di oltre 140 gradi in orizzontale e in verticale. Sutter la diceva così, viviamo in un mondo fisico in cui abbiamo imparato a conoscere bene le proprietà grazie a una lunga familiarità. Percepiamo un coinvolgimento con questo mondo fisico che ci dà la capacità di prevederne bene le proprietà. Ci manca una corrispondente familiarità, lo scriveva nel 1965, un, ci manca una corrispondente familiarità con le forze sulle particelle cariche, le forze in campi non uniformi, gli effetti delle trasformazioni geometriche non proiettive e inerzia, Mol, moto, il, sul moto a basso attrito. Un display collegato a un computer digitale ci dà la possibilità di acquisire familiarità con concetti non realizzabili nel mondo fisico. È uno specchio in un paese delle meraviglie matematiche. Questo lo scriveva nel 1965. Per poter spiegare l'evoluzione storica che ha portato alla creazione dello strumento della realtà virtuale, ehm, appunto dobbiamo parlare di Ivan Sutherland, che nel 1965 appunto sviluppò dal 65 in poi, sviluppò queste tecnologie. Infatti dobbiamo ricordare che nel 1968 Sutherland eh, annuncia il nuovo progetto che battezza con il nome singolare di Spada di Damocle, somma delle teorie avanzate in precedenza. Si tratta di un primo dispositivo, HMD, in grado di mostrare un mondo costruito tridimensionalmente. Dopo vedremo un breve video dell'epoca.
che realmente è, eh, sarebbe una fattispecie di realtà aumentata. In grado di mostrare un mondo tre, costruito tridimensionalmente nel quale l'utente che ne fa esperienza ha la possibilità di girare la testa, cambiando quindi la percezione e la prospettiva di ciò che sta osservando. Lui dice l'idea fondamentale alla base della visualizzazione tridimensionale è quella di presentare all'utente un'immagine prospettica che cambia mentre si muove, quello che abbiamo visto prima, no? L'immagine retinica degli oggetti reali che vediamo è solo bidimensionale. Possiamo creare l'illusione, dice lui, Sutherland, che stia vedendo un oggetto tridimensionale. Ricreare virtualmente l'illusione del movimento reale, facendo in modo che l'immagine tridimensionale presentata sullo schermo cambi di prospettiva nella stessa maniera con cui cambia la visione dell'oggetto reale, seguendo i movimenti del capo. Realizzare in un mondo virtuale la stessa, la stessa prospettiva che un essere umano ha nel mondo reale, facendo dipendere maggiormente dal concetto di kinetic death effect, quindi consentendo il movimento dell'individuo all'interno dell'architettura virtuale, con le conseguenze fisiologiche e psicologiche di ciò che l'occhio sta guardando. In questo modo, Sutherland riteneva che fosse possibile mostrare un oggetto o apparentemente vicino o apparentemente lontano dall'osservatore e che muovendo la testa quest'ultimo potesse esplorare tutte le dimensioni vedendolo da dietro, da davanti, lateralmente, eccetera. Da un punto di vista strutturale, la spada di Damocle, realizzata da Sutherland, assieme al suo team, era composta dai seguenti elementi. Lo vedete lì, un po', sembra un po' complicato. Due tubi di raggi catodici che scendevano verticalmente sopra la testa dell'utente. Sarà proprio questa particolare struttura a caratterizzarne poi il nome. Un computer usato come matrice principale, un visore che mostra l'oggetto tridimensionale e i sensori di posizionamento della testa. Questi ultimi rivelano, siamo nel 1968, rivelano e forniscono le coordinate del posizionamento dell'individuo all'interno della stanza, il quale è comunque condizionato dai tubi catodici che ne limitano fortemente il movimento, ovviamente in quel caso. Oggi abbiamo abolito queste, queste limitazioni. Le coordinate vengono lette dal computer che le elabora assieme agli algoritmi dell'oggetto, costruendolo tridimensionalmente, grazie alla matrice mol moltiplicatrice che calcola e quindi l'ambito la, della, della computazione e realizza l'immagine, passando dalle coordinate della stanza alle coordinate dell'occhio umano. Al tempo della sua re realizzazione, Sutherland ha cercato di risolvere il limite fisico della finestra che delimitava il campo visivo e altri problemi ovviamente legati a tutta quell'impalcatura. E questo lo avvicinerebbe, quello che vedremo adesso, maggiormente a una sperimentazione di realtà mista o aumentata, piuttosto che a un, quello che è una real, reale eh, esperienza di realtà virtuale immersiva. È molto breve. E adesso vedete quello che... E poi vedrete quello che vede... che sta vedendo attraverso questo strumento, ecco, un cubo, quindi soprattutto è una realtà aumentata, dove c'è questa sovrapposizione di questo oggetto alla realtà che esiste. Un altro importante nome, l'informatico statunitense Jaron Lanier, che nel 1984 conia il termine, a lui si deve il termine di eh, virtual reality, o la sua di diffusione soprattutto. Ehm, lui fonda insieme a un altro eh, autore che mh, negli anni 80, Thomas Zimmerman, la VPL Research Inc. dal 1984. Infatti la VPL è una delle compagnie attuali che produce questi visori. visori. E quindi lui eh, si, diciamo, si occupa soprattutto dell'implementazione dei visori ma non soltanto dei visori, anche dei controller, come li chiamano loro, Data Globe, Data Suite, cioè questi guanti, eh, questi strumenti che permettono poi anche eh, di controllare quello che, eh, o di interagire, eh, di sensori a fibre ottiche, in, tratto, in, in grado di tracciare il movimento del corpo, delle mani, traslandolo poi nell'architettura della realtà simulata. Questo è importante, quello che poi saranno le evoluzioni di quello che oggi abbiamo. 
Poi sembra che la situazione resti dagli anni Ottanta in uno stallo per i successivi vent'anni. L'iniziale ondata di interesse per questo strumento è momentaneamente, potremmo dire così, accantonata anche a causa delle limitazioni tecniche del computer e dei, dei fondi e quindi anche dell'ingente eh, finanziamenti, legati anche al fatto che c'era bisogno di processori che mantenessero costante il render grafico del mondo virtuale tridimensionale e seguissero contemporaneamente i movimenti della testa e del corpo con una velocità giusta al fine di non acuire il senso di nausea e vertigini che può crearsi con l'uso della realtà virtuale. Ecco, nonostante ciò, c'è una, una specie di salto, vedete, dal 1968, 65 e 68, a poi agli anni 90. Nonostante ciò, come afferma anche Lanier, durante questo ventennio il media della realtà virtuale viene testato in ambito ingegneristico, automobilistico, marittimo, meccanico, aeronautico, come simulatore e anche, sarà molto importante quello l'ambito aeronautico, queste saranno altre basi per l'introduzione dei media nell'ambito dell'intrattenimento e della narrazione audiovisiva, che sarà poi il boom dagli anni 2000 in poi, 2010. Si arriva così effettivamente alla prima decada del 2000, 2010, quando negli Stati Uniti vengono create diverse società startup, tra cui anche il marchio Oculus, che propongono modelli con schermi piatti, con motion tracking, con una grafica più veloce, a prezzi più accessibili. La realtà virtuale entra così nel, pian nel piano commerciale dell'intrattenimento, quindi uno dei grandi settori, e da qui seguiranno nuovi sviluppi e possono avere un impatto reale sul set fisico. Un precursore letterario del metaverso è il cyberspazio di realtà virtuale creato da William Gibson, chiamato Matrix, nel romanzo di fantascienza del 1984, Neuromante. Una moderna reincarnazione, una moderna reincarnazione letteraria del metaverso è l'Oasis. Questo forse tutti hanno visto il film di romanzo di fantascienza, poi eh, reso film nel 2011, Ready Player One, scritto il, il romanzo da Ernest Klein. Oasis è un gioco virtuale, di realtà virtuale, online, multiutente di massa, che si è evoluto nella destinazione online predominante per il lavoro, l'istruzione e l'intrattenimento. È un mondo di gioco aperto, una costellazione di pianeti virtuali. Ecco, lì si è raffigurato una sorta di reale metaverso in cui tutti gli utenti accedono attraverso un solo accesso alla stessa, real alla st allo stessa realtà virtuale, che è il metaverso, dove giocano, dove possono... E le evoluzioni che vorrebbero eh, darci mh, eh, questi visionari oggi è dove noi potremmo vivere, secondo Max Zuckerberg, l'80% del nostro giorno o del, del nostro tempo della giornata all'interno di spazi virtuali dove posso intrattenermi, dove posso andare a scuola, dove posso andare a fare lezione, dove posso andare a visitare i miei pazienti virtuali, eccetera, eccetera. Nel campo delle realtà virtuali metaverso è stato concepito come l'Internet 3D o Web 3.0, esiste anche il 4.0 già. La sua prima interazione è stata concepita come una rete di mondi virtuali in cui gli avatar sarebbero stati in grado di viaggiare senza soluzione di continuità tra di loro. Questo è il grande tema di oggi, la, che oggi non c'è questa possibilità di viaggiare senza soluzione di continuità. Questa visione è stata realizzata, per esempio, out, in, uh, example, in uh, various uh, works, various world virtual social autonomous worlds based on software, open source software, have already been present, but uh, we're still lacking the um, breaking of time today. There's a version of actualization of the universe in which various platforms and social level would be uh, compatible, both from the uh, gaming point of time and the Uh, uh, there exists a, a catalog already of seven rules of the metaverse, the seven laws or the seven rules of the metaverse, which include a kind of uh, manifesto at the public and global level, a proposal for the development, for future development, based on the preceding development, which has been accumulated with the development of internet and of the WWW, the World Wide Web. According to this proposal, according to this proposal, there should be just a single metaverse, rule number one, and not many metaverses or multiverses. 
as uh, as uh, successive interactions of the internet. Rule number two, that's new rule number seven, sorry. As such, the metaverse uh, should be for everyone. Number two, it should be open, number four. It should be independent from hardware, number five. It should be online, number six. And it should be controlled collectively, rule number three. Okay? As such, the metaverse should be for everyone, for equity, this is very important, and should be open, number uh, rule four, independent from hardware, uh, rule five, online, rule six, and collectively controlled, rule number three. So it would be kind of uh, Decalogue, Ten Commandments. I remember here the experience of Royal Coffer and Ethics, which was signed by uh, uh, February 2020. We were there. Uh, the uh, pandemic was just beginning on Via de Contrilazio, and we were challenging COVID. <coughs> this speaks of, this roll call speaks of, okay, transparency, inclusion, responsibility, security and privacy, reality, and impartiality, education, rights. These are the six principles and three impact areas, ethics, uh, education, and rights. It's kind of a manifesto that recalled uh, important principles like that of equity for everyone, et cetera, et cetera, and independence and control of collectivity. The metaverse, in the end, is not a co new concept in its principal dimensions. They are illustrated in this image here, which I already showed you earlier, the technical dimensions and the subjective and theological dimensions and principles. Uh, important. These are important principles and also important challenges. However, the, in the framework of reality of the metaverse, Okay. There are challenges, important, significant challenges, uh, significant challenges, and therefore it's necessary to have a, a reflection that we w want to open, a reflection that would be as interdisciplinary as possible. This is why we are doing this uh, sixth in edition of neurobioethics and metaverse of uh, specialization. These are images of some a couple of days ago, as you know, if you don't know, we are part, uh, our neurobiotechnical group is a, a part of a, is a research group in a, a university, European of Rome, Euro, European University, and the Athenaeum, uh, where uh, we are working in Spain, Chile, Mexico. These are images of a few days ago in the Anahuac universe of Mayab, uh, Merida, where we, in one of our Jamela, our sister university, we see the application of uh, structures of virtual reality within uh, medical education, therefore in the educational uh, field of teaching. And we have already uh, have a nice uh, collaboration. We have the possibility also to interact in a virtual way. <coughs> and for the most, pro, uh, for, uh, those who want to accompany me for the most fortunate next year, will be able to also see the application that in various of our universities are already used, especially in the medical field <coughs> and in the faculty of engineering, etc. In all of this, we do this, and we all in all of this we seek to humanize technology and to render ourselves more human through uh, uh, technology. What we will see, and with this I conclude, in the next uh, uh, months, in October and November, etc., will be the uh, technological aspects from the engineering point of view and we'll go more deeply into that. We'll take a look at some uh, various applications. What I briefly uh, described today, we will face, and then we will face the field of issue of the uh, clinical field, and especially the neurological aspect and neuro rehabilitation and neurosurgical and uh, augmented uh, reality, especially already starting out with some great centers of research in Milan, et cetera, et cetera where they are where they already intervene in in the post-operative phase. We will see some of the positive aspects and and then we and the ethics and we will move on to psychiatric and psychological applications and then we will make some philosophical reflections. I'm already speaking of January and February and Mar in Mar March and the Dana Foundation and then the challenges in the juridical sphere and the the biological theological uh, aspect. And we'll conclude in June with the June seminar, which usually we do. 
uh, the challenges or reflections on the metaverse and uh, theology. <laughs> With this, I thank you for your attention. We've uh, uh, we've taken two hours. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Okay, we conclude. Is there questions? We can do it like this. Since all the um, enrichment we will do in the next months in the technological level, if there are questions that are inherent to this, we will take a look at them with our technicians, our informational technicians in October and November. We will we'll have interaction with other research centers in North, in the North, and also here in Rome with Santa Lucia, where we will have some experts in the engineering aspect for applying this technology uh, for recovery. It's exceptional. I thank you. We thank Professor Carrara for this incredible um, uh, discourses that he made uh, regarding the history in these two hours from uh, interrupt. He didn't interrupt himself. Uh, and he told us and presented and presenting in this uh, new field for us. So yes, speak. This is why we have the, our appointment will be the next uh, seminar. Gone a little bit beyond time. There were uh, decided on. We we began a few minutes late, so we stopped a few, a few minutes late. Okay, so I'll give you. Did you want to say something? Yes. I forgot. What your students from the university, the European University of Rome, were connected. For now, we will give the code. <coughs> Therefore, don't uh, run away. We give the code of uh, attendance for our students at the uh, um, European U University of Rome. We'll meet again. No. We will meet again on the 28th of October at uh, 5 p.m. An invitation will be sent to everyone. Well, you'll have time to reflect on this incredible, incredible field that's really, um, and from certain point of views, is a little bit worrisome. But um, the the word virtual reality it almost seems a counter. Uh, how if it's a, it almost seems an oxymoron. But the more we enter into these uh, issues, uh, subjects, we realize at the linguistic uh, level, it almost seems that concepts. This is a, this should go more deeply. Okay. Once again, I want to uh, uh, greet everyone. And I would like to thank the person who uh, 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 welcomed us, this beautiful uh, Anthony, Pontifical Anthony and Regina Postolorum, the Faculty of Biothics and the Faculty of uh, Institute of Science and Faith and the UNESCO Cathedra of Biothics and uh, Regina Postolorum. So uh, I'd like to say goodbye to everyone, and we'll meet again on the 20. And we'll uh, stop now, and we'll meet again on the uh, 28th of October. Now, in a few minutes, for I'll stay here for students of the uh, University, European uh, University of Rome, and I'll answer. I'll give you the code for the chat for the uh, students of the university, European University of Rome. Okay. Otherwise, a goodbye, and we'll we'll see each other again very soon.